welcome uh, everybody. Uh, I see Marilyn's here from the Mosquito and Christina and Jeannie. Thank you both for coming. Uh, we are in the, uh, we, we've just gone out of executive session. We've just reopened the uh, general meeting and uh, we're now at community input. Uh, is there any community input this evening? Hearing none, we'll move on to the LEPC update. Uh, Chief Fisher. Thank you. Um, so the LEPC met Monday morning. Um, we have been busy. Um, the uh, COVID cases are up slightly, uh, 163 in Carlisle since we first began measuring, 148 confirmed, 15 probable. Um, our positivity rate for those that are tracking is at 1.4%. Uh, last week was 1.17. So, you know, while any COVID cases are too many, you know, we, we've, all, we've had relatively few. Um, the um, Board of Health um, is working on joining um, seven other communities to do a regional uh, vaccination site. Um, and that is in process. Uh, the state did like the look of the initial application, um, and it, uh, it's looking positive that in some fashion that will occur. There's a, another important meeting on Thursday at uh, 1 p.m. when uh, some of the fine-tuning will be done about that regional um, vaccination site. Um, and... Um, of course, Chief Soros would tell you that uh, one of the things he reported on is that they're continuing to do <clears throat> COVID tests and they are contemplating reducing those hours because the numbers of people asking for tests have gone down. But his, um, his staff have uh, done a remarkable uh, job of this and a remarkable service for our town. Um, COA, uh, is plugging away. They got another small grant to do uh, more activities in Carlisle. <clears throat> they have a, a host of things going on this month um, to, um, to help people feel less impacted by this uh, crazy time. Um, the neighbor response team continues to get food for those in Carlisle that should not be going to grocery stores. Um, um, the schools, the, uh, the teachers have been making appointments. Um, we're, we're trying as, as part of that regional um, vaccination site to potentially get time for teachers. That's one request that came out of the LEPC um, that um, our schools would like time. Uh, we've not been provided an answer, of course, in the state yet. But in the meantime, um, Superintendent O'Shea did say that teachers are getting appointments and some of them have begun to get vaccinated. Uh, things at the library are going swimmingly. Uh, they're doing a, a lot of important work uh, during these times. And um, I think that's a, a, about it uh, from the highlight standpoint, but I, we are, there are several members um, of LEPC on this one. Did it, what did I leave out? Uh, Chief Soros, any members of the board, Tim? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good. Thank you. And uh, just to uh, reiterate, I mean, the, the work of an awful lot of people have just been fantastic during this entire emergency. And the COA, the library, uh, fire police uh, just have been outstanding. And uh, it's, I think I may have mentioned this before, we, we have a visitor in, in our home for several weeks and she's astonished at the kinds of services this town offers its residents. It's just, it's just unheard of. And uh, we're hoping she won't stay. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't tell you said that. <laughs> but it's a, uh, it's really, it's, 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 it's a pleasure. I mean, it's, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be a resident of this town and see the kind of contributions that people are making on behalf of our fellow residents. It's truly outstanding. Thank you. All right. Uh, once again, we're ahead of schedule. Uh, thank you, Chiefs. If you want, you can stay if you want, but uh, you're free to go if you want also. Uh, 
Maybe they want to hear about the Highland Building. The Highland Building. That's why I do too. Um, that's, uh, <laughs> the Highland Building. I do really want to hear about the budget priorities. <laughs> there you go. Uh, probably stuck with this bald head for a little while. Okay. All right. Maybe uh, Tuesday here, though. So. We do. Why don't we do the uh, cemetery deed transfers? Those are. Oh, those quick. are. We can get, up, really get those out of the way while yeah. we're. I know time. they're controversial, but you know. We, yeah. You know. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can get those. Uh, let me see. Cemetery deeds. I move that the select board vote to transfer land in the public burial ground to Andrew and Denise Sturtz of 372 East Street at Green Cemetery, Lot D-194, Graves 1234, in exchange for the return of Cemetery, Lot D-270, Graves 1 and 2, and Lot D-272, Graves 1, 2, and 3. Doesn't seem like a fair exchange. Uh, it's 4 for 5. Is that right? <laughs> Don't they get any money back along with that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Well, I'm I'm just wondering, it does not seem like a fair exchange since they're turning in uh one, two, three, four, five lots and getting four back. So uh, is there something I'm missing? Do we refund them the money for the last lot? I, I'm not sure about that. We we can bring that to the next meeting. Find out what the situation is in the meantime. If I don't think there's an imminent, uh, it's not urgent, need. right? We don't have somebody dead. Oh, that we nobody's can waiting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you, who who administers this um, in terms of payment? Does that fall under? Mr. Town Clerk. Town Clerk. I'm just thinking that I'm guessing that would all be worked through with that person. But. Right. No, I, 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 Gary works with the Town Clerk and uh, uh, once they make the, the set up the transaction, they, they send it to Jen. Well, so we not shall we table this for the time being? Yeah, I think that would be my recommendation until yeah. we until we figure it out. Even up the yeah. numbers, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. I I will accept the motion to table. Uh, this I withdraw. Item to a time certain of the next select board meeting. Yeah. There you go. Second. Okay. Oh, I mean, uh, so moved. <laughs> okay. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Roll call vote. Arnold, I. Muscalillo, I. Louis I. Read I. Thank you. Well, we're still ahead of schedule and I don't see Highland Committee here yet. TM. Is FinCon presenting something tonight or are we just reviewing? No. They're coming to on the 23rd. Right. With the draft budget. Tonight with all this information that's in the packet. Well, that's for us to discuss the the budget priorities. Right. See what our opinion is. Yep. And I and I did attend the finance committee meeting last night, so I know what they've done as well. Uh -huh. okay. Yep. Tim, want to give his uh, administrative report? Sure. Yep. Okay, Tim. Happy to do that. Uh, the first item in the report is the uh, letter from the governor's office on the. Uh, FY22 apportionment of chapter 90 for Carlisle, which is within a couple hundred dollars of what it was last year. And for those that are interested, I attached the uh, a recent history of chapter 90 and what we have received from the Commonwealth. There's no board action uh, required at this time, but I thought you would want to see the letter. Uh, is that based on a formula, Tim? I, I mean, I noticed that it, 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 yeah. it's less now than it was a few years ago. Yeah. yeah, there is a formula and it's based on road miles and a few other factors. Uh, uh, but it, uh, there were some years where you really can't uh, figure out why it goes way up or way down. It, it, it's been around 250, 260 for mm -hmm. a, a lot of years. So I think that that's probably the uh, kind of the default okay. amount. Okay. And also uh, in the town administrator's report, you'll see the uh, 
Uh, the final FY20 uh, budget report from our town accountant, Priscilla Dumka. And you'll see that the end of year surplus was uh, nearly $900,000 due to uh, departments taking the uh, uh, spending freeze to heart at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, there are a number of significant uh, fund turnbacks for many departments, including better than 200,000 from the school uh, department. So uh, that'll be reflected uh, in our free cash at a future point, but it uh, uh, just uh, evidence that, you know, people uh, were told to, you know, hold the line on, on spending that wasn't strictly uh, uh, necessary uh, or had an immediate need. And, and uh, they, did, they did hold the line on that. I'm going to ask you this later, but um, I guess my big question would be, okay, okay, this is the 200 or so from the school, but um, that still leaves like 700 from the rest of the town. And what did we not spend? Um, and what, you know, can we still continue to put off spending and what really needs to be spent? I think, well, it, it, it's a rather long spreadsheet, but the, the final column on the right shows kind of the, sort of the, the uh, uh, the plus and minus for every budget uh, uh, departmental line item and where it finished up for the year. Some of them were supplemented uh, by transfers at town meeting. Uh, I think the insurance account and uh, uh, maybe legal uh, services is another, but the spreadsheet does show which departments uh, came in significantly under budget and, and which spent closer to the line. And there were some line items that did go into the red, but balancing them all out uh, we finished the year in the black. Well, was it labor costs or was it, I mean, where? You can see it on the sheet. Yeah, okay. It was hard to read because so, it's, it's on, a long right. one. Yeah. So it's <clears throat> the columns all the way out to the right. I'm using my little magnifier. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. It's all the way magnifier. out to the right. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, where I'm just trying to think of where the big expenditures were. So the big expenditure, there's one big expenditure, the copy machine, for instance, you know, it's like, um, oh, that's deficit before. Yeah, the, the well, but it says net unexpended appropriation. No, you, wanted a, you want a positive number, so. I'm looking at, uh, okay. So the police did well, they saved 112K, which Sir Chief Fisher will I'd want to bring up in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, transfer station actually did well. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but um, I mean, not transfer station, public works, I should say. 116K. School is mentioned, 200 something. Yeah, school is in here. 213, 936, 81. Okay. Also, reserve fund, we didn't spend a. Two line items, I guess. And there's yeah, group insurance. Group insurance was 130k. So that's. Yeah, so there's some big chunks here. Yeah. Reserve fund is 120. Okay, thank you. All right. Well. I mean, yeah, it's it reminds. It's a good job. I mean, people people didn't spend, which, I mean, good or bad, I guess, but there was certainly a fiscal restraint. Let's call it that. Yeah. But it, if, if things are, are like in the insurance, that means that that's not, hope, that's not you know, Damocles sword over our heads. Um, if it wasn't spent, it was because it didn't need to be spent. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't think that was held back because of the spending freeze. No, I don't think, I mean, the departments, a couple of the heads of departments are on this meeting. I mean, Chief Fisher could probably tell us what he didn't spend on and why. Well, I can tell you, we didn't do as much training as we've done in the past. Um, we did not, you know, staff special events like um, old home days. Right. Um, you know, some of the things that we did and, you know, we were pretty specifically told, unless you absolutely need it, if it's, yeah. if it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah. No, I think um, so there were true. a lot of, if it wasn't broke, I didn't fix it. Um, we, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, we received pretty clear directions on that one. So um, yeah, we took it to heart. We did it department wide. It wasn't just me. It was, you know, everybody um, 
didn't get exactly what we would normally do, and that's the way it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Moving on, we've got a request from the Carlisle Garden Club uh, for permission to use the town common on Earth Day, Sunday, April 25th, and also to plant two new trees on the common. They have uh, permission from FRS and uh, the Board of Health to hold a gathering, uh, public gathering, obviously, uh, for Earth Day. And uh, the board has supported this in the past, so a motion to uh, allow them permission to use the, the common uh, on Earth Day would be uh, in order. Did, did they it. talk with historic? <laughs> historic? Yeah. Oh, to plant the trees? Yeah. Trees uh, have been an issue in the past with historic on the common. When trees come down and when trees go up, yeah. yeah there was a certain pine tree. Um, because there's supposedly a whole design on the, the look that they're going for. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. <laughs> but, you know, uh, technically it is a historic district, you know, but I mean, can you, can, can they determine who plants a tree and where? Yeah, actually in historic district, I don't think they're able to, they don't have jurisdiction over landscaping in. I, I, I don't think so, but maybe as a courtesy. Yeah. Maybe we can um, s approve this uh, with the uh, recommendation that they um, consult consult yeah. with the historic commission. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because they want to know what kind of tree, and you know, I mean, you know, there is a little bit to it. You don't want, you know. Well, it's you know, it's Allison Sailor and the Garden Club, and I know they're going to be incredibly careful. But yeah, I think it's a good idea just for good relations. Okay. May I have a motion? Uh, so, yeah. Um, I move that the select board um, approve the request from the garden club to uh, plant, uh, should I say two trees? Is that what they're suggesting? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Plant two trees on the common. In Let's see, ask for three. Um, one. No, it's two. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, to plant two trees on the town common. Well, well I, I, sorry to interrupt again, but I'm reading her note, right? Isn't it one new tree and two replacement trees? Oh. Is it one replacement and two new trees? As yeah, part of the Earth Day right. celebrations, we want to plant a native tree on the common with hoopla and community spirit in abundance. Blah, blah, blah. Additionally, I'm asking for two other trees to be planted. These might be considered replacement trees for the two that failed to thrive when the late Eunice Knight went through all the required permissions to get four trees planted on the common back in 2001. Okay. So I, I do believe it's three. Yeah, it's a total of three. So let me try that again. <laughs> um, I move that the, um, that the select board approve the request from the garden club to uh, plant one uh, new native tree and two replacement trees on the town common uh, for Earth Day and uh, with a recommendation that they uh, confer with the historic commission. And it, it, it should also, we're granting them the use of the common on Earth Day. Mm. And the use of the common on Earth Day. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote. Arnold, aye. Oscar Lillo, aye. Lewis, aye. Reed, aye. Reed, aye. Thank you. Yeah, Tim? I see that uh, John Ballantyne and Jack Trost have joined the meeting if we wanted to stay on schedule. Okay. Welcome to uh, the uh, select board meeting from the Highland folks and uh, the floor is yours. You're, you're muted, John. So um, I've got a presentation uh, just sort of reviewing where we are and I'll share it with you. Um, you. And I apologize that uh, it was just put together day after uh, our Highland meeting yesterday. And basically the point we wanna be making is that 
Highland and the discussions around Highland are part of and in parallel with all these sort of master planning efforts and all the town facilities. And actually, this is kind of a big puzzle where we move one piece, we move one piece, and then another piece, and we're trying to figure out how all of them put fit together. So these are obviously, and I know the speed limit in town now in the center of town is 25, <laughs> but I couldn't find a picture of it at, at, at uh, you know, 35. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> and I have the, the, the prettiest picture of uh, DPW that we <laughs> that we have and not the transfer station. So, I'm, <laughs> um, so anyway, so while the focus is on Highland and what we do on Highland, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I really want to kind of integrate this into the whole discussion of town facilities and the sort of master planning process. So that's, and then, you know, so that's where we're going. So as you know, this has been going on for at least 30 years, the discussion. The school committee couldn't figure out what to do after a while, and it was very difficult for the school committee, and they, they turned Highland over uh, to the select board Lechman at that point. And then I joined uh, the first of the Highland committees and this is the third Highland committee trying to figure out what do we do and how do we do it that is, that is compatible with the school and this proximity to the school and being on the town property that is also school property. So that is, that's the challenge. And we've got a great committee together kind of working that through trying to figure out how can we find ways in a cost effective way to preserve Highland what's going on. This is also very much part of the master planning process. And I'm on the facilities committee looking at the master planning process and the facilities over the longer term horizon. So we're looking at this as sort of an integrated parallel stuff. It is what I'd be showing you and what we're discussing is purely preliminary um, assessment of the facility needs going forward in conversations with the various parties um, around town and also with um, what we've been trying to do and figuring out <clears throat> what, what, what can be done with Highland. And sort of obviously one of the issues that we're looking at Highland is really three options. Possibility for municipal housing, which would be you know, maybe for possible fire or other people, some form of town offices or town uses. And so that gets into all this situation or sort of private offices and private leases. But, but those are the sort of three tangible options for weighing and preserving it or to tear it down. So that's what we're going through. And so I will then show you, here is sort of the square footage needs that we've sort of identified in our conversations. And there's a lot of data and information here, but um, police and fire incremental space needs beyond what they've got now. And, you know, three to 5,000 for the fire adding another 10,000. 10 offices, again, talking with Tim and other people, about a 20% increase or so. Um, recreation, you know, as you know, recreation is kind of all over the place in terms of where they use it. And they're sort of saying, ideally, if we could get 3,000, that'd be terrific. Municipal housing, and again, this ties to fire and maintaining an on-call fire department. If we had some form of municipal housing, that would be terrific in being able to sort of maintain that. And I call it municipal because there may be other uses in terms of doing that. If you look at other towns and communities, they are starting to provide housing for teachers and, and other people, employees, because of the cost of housing. And that becomes sort of, that's a longer term issue. Carlisle Public Schools, right now, it can handle up to about 750. And the sort of population sort of assumptions that we've made here is essentially a town of 6,500, 2,200 um, units. Um, DPW basically repair and maintain and maybe replace that old building. Um, and Gleason is, is, as you know, going digital, digital, so it doesn't need more space. Now the issue with the COA, and as you know, there's been this issue for um, um, community center. If you don't have a community center because of costs and everything else, and they have some other space to use as a um, COA and they might want 5,000 5, square feet. So this is just kind of rough square footage and I'm gonna be focusing primarily up here, but I just kind of putting in the, in the sort of framing it. So if we look at police and fire, which are obviously sort of on the agenda and that you guys are talking about and that, that the chiefs have been talking about, and then also Highlands sort of looking at these, are these are inter possibly interchangeable pieces. 
police and fire existing 6,600 square feet, and police 6,600 fire around that, 60, maybe 6,700, at least according to facilities plan. So the, if you totally new and renovated 10,000 uh, for the police in a, a new facility, and Chief Fisher can talk to that and what that might require. And also with fire, maybe if you use existing facility, adding another 10,000 with bays and everything like that. So that's more or less it. We obviously don't have site design. We don't have clear designs there. We just have kind of general square footage. And um, as, as you know, Stu Roberts is on the facilities committee and he's a person who's experienced both in building and designing police and fire. So he, we've been really kind of going with him. Um, so in the combined facility, which is obviously one of the options that we've been looking at, the police and fire is about 30,000 square feet. We haven't identified where that might be talking about that. And then Highland of 7,000, 6,500 sort of usable. So Highland gross is a little bit more. So focusing on that, if you have moving pieces, this is what we're kind of looking at. And this is what we discussed last night. The police, fire, and town offices incremental square footage needs about 15,000. So where that comes from is figures here. So about 15,000 square feet and then the recreation and municipal housing another 8,000. We've got existing square footage right now of the existing police and fire and Highland of about 20,000. Well, again, this is kind of the jigsaw puzzle. If you move one piece around, if let's say you, you build a new um, police station but and just add to the fire station, then you freed up 6,500 feet, and then you've got Highland. And so there is a process, and this is what we're thinking about, trying to understand how you might use Highland as, you know, as, as, as meeting one of these needs for the, you know, either expanding town office or recreation space or a municipal. So those are the types of things that we're thinking about. There are lots of questions that we still need to go through. Um, in terms of what do these renovations cost? We know new costs a lot more than uh, renovating. And again, the cost estimates vary from two to $300 per square foot for renovating. And, you know, Brian will, 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 will is, have to do it at, at what level and how well do you design it and things like that. If you're doing it for municipal housing, if you build it new, it's going to cost at least $700 per square foot. So you've got this whole issue of looking at all the different costs. And then, so that's the kind of piece, that's what we're going through. We at the Highland Committee have to get a better sense of what the costs are and kind of go through that. We're reaching out. We haven't got obviously any design, but we're trying to figure that out so we can get a better sense of the cost estimate. And then what we're all wrestling with, and that's clearly you guys are wrestling with, is what can the town afford? What's the tax? And, you know, Harry Kissinger, is, is, and, and with some of our advice and from FinCom, has built a 10-year model looking at costs, and I know he shared that with you. Basically, town can probably afford 15 to 20 million of new debt and keep the same tax incidents, assuming a certain rate of inflation and growth of income in the town. So that's sort of where we're at. This is, you know, the summary of the facilities committee, which I'd sent you all along and how we got to all these square footages of what the different, you know, the different things and you don't, here is this, the 17 to 20 million is basically looking at DPW, Highland, the schools, the library, which is just some maintenance. And that's kind of over the next 10 or 15 years. If you do a combined facility, it's probably in the 30 million range. And so that's, again, this is just ballpark. These are estimates. And we're just kind of using this as some guidance. And then Highland fits into this puzzle as one of the solutions. And so that's sort of where we're at. It's part of the master planning process. It's part of you know, the, you know, what you guys have to think about in terms of what Warren articles go forward. And I know there's a consideration of planning on the fire and police and how this fits into um, where Highland would be. We as a committee in Highland are not ready to put forward a or an article because we don't have enough information. Fire and police chiefs feel like they need to kind of go forward with that planning, which is 
really in parallel with what everybody's doing because we need to kind of get moving forward. Um, and that's sort of where we're at. And we're trying to one, keep everybody kind of educated on this and aware of what's going on and uh, make sure the community understands what these needs are. And so there's a whole process of education, clearly more discussion. So that's kind of the summary. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Uh, Mr. Mr. Trost, do you want to add anything to this? <laughs> Sorry. Oh. I don't know how to now get my picture back here. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so no, I don't. I mean, I just uh, I think I I would just support what John said, which is, you know, yesterday as the Highland Committee met, you know, it's pretty clear that everybody on the Highland Committee felt that our efforts ought to track closely with the, um, you know, with the master plan. Uh, activities because of, as John said, these interchangeable pieces to the puzzle. Thank you. All right, uh, select board, questions, comments? Uh, I, hi, this is, uh, well, I guess. Uh, I see you, Barney. <laughs> I can see it, yeah, I, I'm only seeing a part of the, the uh, crowd here, but um, anyway. Um, a couple of things. One, um, have you gotten uh, to the point of discussion with the school administration and school committee and have any sense of where um, where they are on the Highland being put to um, use? Yes, we've had one meeting with the school committee and, and the superintendent and, um, and it was a productive meeting and it's more than um, and that an understanding that there's, you know, we need to figure out a compatible use for any use that's compatible with the school. Um, and the issue of Corey is not really an issue that people in the building do not be Corey, but rather it's kind of a circulation and separation that we make sure that there, that there is that and, and, and obviously there's the, the parking issues, but we haven't gone back to the further discussion because we wanted to really be able to spell things out more more carefully. Um, Christine Lear is on our on the Highland Committee, and so she's you know very supportive of con, you know continuing those conversations and finding ways to make this work. But it's going to take a while. <laughs> There's no question that these things don't happen. Do you have any kind of a timeline? I mean, not not for when you're done, but for how things progress. I would say hopefully over the next two months, we can get to a point where we're have a reason, a much better sense of the sort of line of what the different options might be within Highland and a better feel for the cost. Right now, we just have architects ballparks, which are not, you know, which are the two, three hundred dollars per square foot. And we haven't kind of gone through some level of details. You know, we don't have any resources for design. So we're really counting on sort of the goodwill of people who know this stuff well, you know, like Sue Roberts and, you know, we're going to reach out to Larry Sorley and we're going to, and we've already talked to Eric Adams. So we're going to go through that process to kind of get, get more people involved and hopefully we'll have that. And then we'll have the conversation with the school committee and that by two months from now, that's sort of in May, this will have more meat. <laughs> this probably isn't a fair question, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, any feeling on the probability that the building can be saved? I don't think we have any sense. Of, I mean, I think obviously the people on the committee feel that way. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, so there's obviously that's, that's the nature of the people who were volunteered came forward. And in terms of, you know, where the school is, my sense is that we'll probably figure out pretty reasonable parameters and what can work. And then I, then I think it's of juggling the pieces in the puzzle. Um, if you, I mean, I think the real issue that we were talking about is if you tear it down and then you still need 5,000, 10,000 square feet, it's going to cost you more money than if you're renovating a building. So that some of that's going to come down to the numbers. And as you know, this is an emotional issue for people. Yes. Yeah. Um, John, can I build on those two points? Um, for, can you, can you scroll to your big chart while we're speaking? That one? 
Yeah, that one. Thank you. So the first question I have is the, the uh, cost to renovate cheaper than build new, but is that valid for Highland, which is, you know, cent a century out of code, not a decade out of code? I mean, what? Um, again, I'm, I'm relying on, you know, sort of three architects, <laughs> right? Or, you know, Stu, Stu Roberts, the one who worked on it before, and yeah. Eric, and I think the answer is yes, you can renovate it in that, certainly in that two to $300 range, um, the right. actual bones of it. And when it's been yeah. looked at are pretty pretty good and strong. Okay. Um, and yeah, you know, yeah, there's some stairs that stairs, but stairs are easy to repair. But so that's okay. yes. And that and that includes an elevator, I guess, if you oh you said it varies, that. not necessarily for certain uses. Yeah. Okay. So the, the second question is you kind of alluded to it. I'll see if I can piece it together in my mind. It's true in a square footage basis if you need you know, 5,000 square feet and it's sitting there, it's cheaper to go get that 5,000. But the corollary is that the police and the fire station as they exist need, you know, a huge amount of capital to fix also kind of old and outdated buildings, right? And I don't, I'm looking at your total CapEx line and I guess you've got it captured, but yes, I mean, it's, it's maybe a more, strategic argument than a financial one if it's a close call in other words if you if you forked over the 20 million to do a combined safety building it would be a brand new building for the 21st century where everybody was together and we just mm -hmm. you know, we were combining dispatch i mean there's a lot of right. soft pieces to that where you know that kind of stuff gets answered and if you do that you have to find a different use you can't just take those 5,000 square feet and say, okay, police and fire need 5,000 square feet here, use this, right? I mean, you can't do that. So I'm still kind of at a loss. So I guess, so basically I think your question is if you do the combined police and fire, which is in the 20 million range yeah. for that, then basically the existing um, of fire and existing police can be reused. There's a cost to that, but obviously it can be reused. And as you know, you've already had the COA come forward saying, if that's the case, they would like to see that they could, you know, repurpose the uh, fire as a building that they could use and, okay. the, and the town and the police could be repurposed for expansion of town offices and other things. So, so yes, but again, this is, this is general, not detailed, because you've got to kind of mm -hmm. go through what you would do in terms of design. So that's where this, those numbers come from that, yeah, you, that's why the 30 million means that you're repurposing some of those other buildings. Yeah, no, I, I think I get it on the dollars and you, you're sort of getting to my point. I'm, let's just do a thought piece here. Let's say for a variety of reasons, we do conclude that it's better to build a public safety building from scratch. So, okay, so that's money aside. So where, whatever, that gets, wherever the site is. Wherever the site is, that gets built. So now you've got now three basically unused buildings, police, fire, and Highland. So, okay, so let's take fire and let's pretend, let's say, that's got good use for rec space, combined, maybe combined rec of Council on Aging and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, rec com, whatever. Okay, so that takes care of that one. You're saying the little police building then becomes probably town offices? No Is expansion that... of town offices, yep. Okay, so that still leaves us with Highland. Where, where do you, what would, what would go into Highland in that? Well, scenario? that's where municipal housing gets in there. And this gets into the on call, one of the uses would be on call because if you go back to the net usage of space, you'd still need 25,000 square feet. And so if you had municipal housing that could have on-call fire there, that's one option. Yeah, so I guess I gotta ask Kate, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by that, but Kate, we wrestle with this where we can't really grant town employees much preference in affordable. Isn't that kind of what we learned the other day? Yeah. This is not affordable. This is not affordable in the traditional uh, measure of affordable. Okay. So that's a very different, so it's really important to understand that this is not falling okay. under that. So is, is the, are these, would these units not be for sale, they'd be for rent? Yes. So then that begs the question, who manages that? Because it's, you could know. Could be the village, well, could be the people managing village court. You know, <laughs> you can have other, there are other Benfield. people. The Benfield management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. No, I'm just... And and um, Chief Sorrells and I did discuss that you know um, 
management is an issue we don't have the staff to manage. And if it, it's going to be affordable, uh, then there's all kinds of rules and regs that are attached that need to be carefully adhered to. And if they're not, then, you know, this, does the town want to become a landlord? So we've called it municipal housing, not affordable. That's okay. a very important distinction. It's like right. no, Middlesex we take, has- we take, the, we take the point. But, yeah. but we still have to, to make that happen, we'd have to be a landlord. I mean, if we sold it- Yeah, or it. you have someone else manage it, yes. Well, yeah. same thing. We, we, we but they have to own it. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I mean, I think it's a good logical approach. I'm still sort of left with the feeling that it's a solution in search of a problem, but- well, you look at Middlesex, you look at schools all around the country, they are providing housing for their faculty and staff because they cannot afford to live there. This is, yeah. if you look at where we were in the 19th century, low, you know, the Lowell Mills provided housing for the, the, the girls. So this yeah, has happened. I'm, I'm not against it. I'm not against it from a social perspective. I'm, I'm struggling with the reality of yeah. us being in the landlord business and right. Um, uh, let me ask another sort of provocative question, I guess, is if it didn't have historical significance, would we ever have done anything other than raise it to the ground and put a playground in there or something? A 30 year discussion that uh, <laughs> I've only been part of 10 years of it. So I think uh, I, I'm gonna defer to the town meeting votes and town discussion as we know that's uh, yeah. um, okay. David, if I could just, uh, so am I muted or unmuted? Now you're right. Unmuted. Unmuted. Here you. Great. I would just say, um, <clears throat> I think that's just to pick up on that point, it's, it should be um, noted that there could be resources available. I wouldn't consider the Highland building the odd man out because it's the older building. It could quite frankly be um, more uh, suitable for not only its use, we don't know that for sure, compared, for example, to the police station, yeah. even though it's newer. And furthermore, it may be eligible for grant money and other considerations available to historic buildings that wouldn't be available, for example, for the fire uh, building and other properties in the puzzles, as John said. So the, pu the puzzle has that added element of complexity. Yeah, that's a good point. I and obviously that. the big issue that's gonna be run running into is what is the town willing to afford and to support? And that's a, that's a strong, that's, a, that's gonna take time to digest. So the reason I brought up um, fire was to answer some of these questions. As far, so, you know, our people have to have to live within about four minutes of work for us. And um, we've lost, say, four to six people in the last year because of that. And so, you know, do I want to be a landlord? You know, whatever. But at some point, you have to do what you have to do. Um, and then the management of the building becomes a lot easier if it's if it's used, you know, obviously for 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 fire. We manage buildings. That's what we do is maintain things. So, so some of those get a little bit easier. I think um, one of the things that we have to look at is, you know, what, what are the costs and what level of, of renovation is going to be done. So, you know, that's all in the mix. You know, it, ideally the school would be used for school type activities, but the, you know, the costs there are pretty high. So. You mean Highland would be used for school activities and not. Right. I mean, ideally, that would be you know a, a great thing for after-school activities or something like that. But if you use it for those kinds of things, it costs a lot to bring a, a building to the level that you can do that in. Right. And and um, you know, you were talking earlier about code. Code for residential building is very different. You know, the need for elevators, the need for handicapped access, the need for a lot of these things um, changes. Right. So. Well, aren't so you, I, I, mean, I, I agree with that. Aren't you, Brian, going to find that if you try to build housing in Ireland, that you need no. bathrooms and... Oh, yeah, you need bathrooms, but, you know, but it, it's, it's a lot lower cost and according and to... Where does, the, where does the... Would that then go to the, the municipal waste treatment facility? Mm -hmm. A lot of... Uh, right, yep. so that's one thing about the building. It does have um, 
already sprinkler system to tie into of the schools. And yes, you would you would tie into the wastewater treatment plant and maybe even the tap the school's uh, water supply. That's an interesting approach. I think, I guess from my view, it'd be good to explore that, you know, to try to settle on. It sounds like you're beginning to coalesce around an approach, let's say. And, and I believe personally, just I guess, that the approach is set the public safety you know, on its own path and then look at those three buildings and what the best um, use you know, of the three is and, and pursue kind of a thumbnail outline of how that works. It makes sense, I mean, it makes sense on a level, I guess, as you said, the total cost has to be you know, looked at. Yeah, and I don't, and I know, I mean, you know, uh, Chief Fisher and, and Chief Sarles and I all talked about it, trying to figure out what's the best way to go. It's not immediately obvious. And we're all trying to, we're wrestling with that and trying to look at it and looking at the overall costs and you know what site it would be on. And you know, if you do Banta Davis, that has a whole set of other sets of issues and so, so I think there are a whole there are a whole bunch of things that still need in this puzzle need to kind of be fully explored, and that's what we're. Okay. That's why I think the one of the art Warren article possible Warren articles is just that figuring out how to work out those. Right, so how much how much money do you need like now to kind of give you enough planning money to get some of these questions answered? We are Highland isn't asking for any. We're going to do as best we can on what we've got. I that's that's. You know that was our sort of charge. I mean, and so we're trying to figure out how to do it, and so and coming up with a reasonable estimate of costs. And um, we don't want to we don't want to go to the town without we, without a, a good plan and sort of laying that out. And okay. police and fire I think are yeah. instead of issues. Is there any con concept of how many housing units Highland could support? It's right now, if you look at the configuration, you've got four classrooms. It's a perfect for four classrooms and the basement becomes, you know, the, um, the heating and AV system and storage. Okay. So is that four apartments? Yes. Yeah. Each about a thousand feet, square feet, more or less. It's a little bit, you know, you've got some hallways. So twice the size of a New York apartment. Yeah. Right, exactly. In New York apartments, <laughs> 2,500 for, <laughs> for 600 square feet. <laughs> Yeah, if you, if you go in it, it doesn't, because there is a, a fair amount of kind of common space if you did it without moving a lot of walls around, but um, it's it's a very reasonable size, both it's big enough and it's not too big. I think I think if you walked into it, you'd, you'd be surprised how almost perfect it is for, for the right size. Okay. So I, um, I, I just uh, want to just raise again, I think the uh, importance of um, bringing the school committee along and the school administration because um, some of the feedback I've gotten uh, as as the idea of putting um, you know individual rental units into Highland is that uh, there's a lot of concern about um, the, the occupancy um, of you know young adults. Um, being right next to the school. And um, so I think it'd be much- no, I, I told, I mean, we, we've had that conversation. I totally agree. And I think any use that we have to have is compatible with the school and sort of laying out guidelines on that basis. Yeah, I just would urge you not to go too far down the the road on on any of the options that you're looking at for Highland, without making sure they're really they have a, they're viable uh, within Absolutely. the the uh, school committee and school context. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, totally agree. I know. Um, the other thing I noted was that um, the community center is at the bottom of your chart as uh, not being considered. Um, um, no, I think the oh, issue, this one, that yeah, one, or it says no community center. I wasn't, I just wasn't. Well, so sure. basically the issue, you know, this was without the 15, this is that 17 to 20 million is without a community center. Yeah. And so that's the issue that as we start looking at all these budget numbers, and, and as you know, when the COA has kind of gone through this, this is a, a strong wish that they have. 
But to make it happen, the COA certainly realizes, and we talked about this other facilities committee, they're gonna to have to find some way to raise additional monies to help pay for the capital call. Ideally, you could you know, do an Emerson umbrella, but where there's just a realization that we start running into a possible a roadblock. And so that's the real issue. To get a community center, you're starting, you're moving into the 30 million range, and that's clearly gonna be an increase in the taxes. So the average well, tax I would, would say clearly an increase in the taxes depending on the model and that you know that's a key issue the community center that we would hope the master plan would re-engage the town on and we'd get you know feedback from them so i think john's just showing the numbers with and without the community center john you're not making no. the assumption that the community center is a no right. vote. It's just saying if it right. was not included, this right. is what it looks like. Right. Yeah, and you know, I've I've raised this before, and it's because I've seen it in a couple of other towns where, um, you know, they have the public safety um, structure in in uh, and attached to it at a, sort of a different level is a community center or community mm -hmm. resource building. So. Um, you know, I, I just think that's a piece of this that could, would, um, lessen the cost of, uh, of a community center if there was really strong support for that, right? If it was part of a, a new structure rather than being a standalone new building. Yeah, I mean, I, yes, I mean, that gets into you know, redesign and number square footage and things like that, obviously, what you're the cost here are based on a number of square feet and you have fewer square feet or yeah and um i'm also wondering again i don't want to get too much into the weeds so tell me if i'm right. going there but um it looked like from some of your your previous uh graphs which i don't uh yeah here the so the increase in square footage um seems really quite significant from existing to what the desired I assume this is the sort of um, yeah this is the the so this is uh, this is the current square footage that's what the new would be and again yeah and I'm just and, saying that's almost um, you know that's almost a, a, what sixty percent increase in square footage for fire again not that I gosh you know I'm the first one to say we need um, a lot of that's base you know safety. if you look if you go into the fire station and as I have. You've got inches between the doors. No, I know, I know and John. There's no room. I know, I know but no. I'm just I'm just raising that um, again. I I don't know, you know exactly where these numbers came from, and I uh, in terms of what what calculations were made, and and maybe this is looking at you know be really desirable to have. But I think if if one of the things we're um, trying hard to do is to uh, balance you know what we can afford with what we want mm -hmm. or or what is desirable i i think we should be um you know really yeah, i mean you can be fine carefully hang on looking carefully at the total square footage we're talking about and it may be that we have to go with something more modest that still meets the needs for good uh public uh, you know fire and and um, police safety so I, i'm just putting that out because yeah, i no, fair enough you know I, th I think when you talk about a new structure, sometimes it's like, wow, okay, let's go for really the state of the art, the best thing we can get. And it just may be for a town this size that that is not financially viable. Oh, that's true. That's true. And I, and I, and, and Stu Roberts, whose business is this, was, is, you know, primarily the, gu the guiding light on how we do this. What, what do similar towns have? What's the square footage? What do you need? Do that and that's how that came up and obviously we, we run it by both keeps but that's the initial estimate and this is not a design anything right. like that this is just a just to give you a ballpark and if you want to try to pull the ballpark to be smaller and pull in the wall and things like that and you know that, you know well, that I, can happen I think it's yeah i just think it's important for um the the process you know the the sort of continued research and discussion going forward to, um, and, and maybe it's thinking about ranges, right? There, there um, or ways to um, 
you know, be creative about meeting our needs, uh, but still trying to keep a really, really close eye on the cost. So, but Marty, I, would... I, I would just add to that there, there has been no, I think John's alluded to this. Well, these are ballpark numbers. There's been no facility audits on any of these buildings to the level of an architectural study. Right. Um, with the po with ironically the possible exception of the Highland building, because that was studied uh, pretty extensively in the last go round, and there were drawings done, and there was an architect hired and a um, you know a complete uh, square foot breakout by you know room. Uh, but other than that, uh, the rest of these have not involved that level of um, architectural evaluation. And that, yeah, and that yeah. certainly would be part of a fire and police warrant article on how you go forward, because that's not within our committee purview to try to design through. That's, you know. Yeah, I, I think to me, there's there are two different problems. And that's what I said earlier. I think we, we overly complicate this jigsaw puzzle if we try to tie everything to everything else. I think from a thought process in my mind, as I said earlier, if we think there's a reasonable argument to be made for a public standalone public safety building, again, assuming we can find a site, I think we that goes on its own little project to design. And I, I wanna push back a little on what Barney said. I think if we're gonna go 20 million versus say 25 million, I don't know. <laughs> That's a building we want to not have to revisit for another 50 or 60 years if we can hopefully do that. So that requires a lot of strategic thought about how public safety is evolving, what kind of equipment, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure the two chiefs have lots to say about that. So that best practice and where that design goes, goes on its own little path. And of course, we want to be cost effective, but it, that's got to be a building designed for 2050 and beyond. Then we come back to the existing infrastructure problem and say, what's the best use of those three existing buildings? And I agree with Jack, you know, we shouldn't just single out Highland, it's the three buildings. And, you know, maybe one of them just goes away. It may not be worth fixing. I don't know. But certainly if one thinks about the shape of the fire building, as a big open space, or at least a lot of it is big and open, you know, that kind of guides towards a, a recreational community center type use, again, without knowing the cost, but that those decisions become separate from public safety and the total square footage is almost immaterial because you're in two different, you're in at two different decision points at that time. I guess where the master planning is that's saying that these are all these all these decisions are interrelated and you may have priorities, which is what you're saying that's a priority for the police and fire. Well, but but there, they're and there are other issues. A, they're interrelated from a decision tree. Correct. But, which is where you're at. But but we get we could be we could be uh, you know stymied or uh, frozen by inaction if we try to make it too. I think what you're doing is right, John, and I agree with it. But I'm saying there's a point in time where we say. Let's look at a scenario. A scenario is building a public safety building. Let's go, you know, maybe we'll fund an architectural study this, this time or not, but at some point we're gonna fund a study to see what that looks like. As soon as you take that position, the whole nature of those three buildings is different, mm -hmm. right? right? And Correct. so that's a scenario. Now you can come up with another scenario that says, no, you know, you've got it on your other chart, right? We should fix the two existing buildings and only supplement where we have some space. I, I just, I have a hard time at this point seeing how that's a good solution, but you know, it's, it's a scenario. So all I'm trying to say is right now, everything's tied to everything else, but pretty soon you have to make an assumption and that begins to disentangle that web. Correct. Correct. I mean, I think whether you go with the combined um, safety building, is it is an important decision that the town would do it? Or if you do a separate one, and that's the right. issue. And, and, and those that are the decision, issues. That decision should have nothing to do really with whether Highland is renovatable or not. I, I would that'd be my advice. It, that decision is kind of its own set of decisions based on the two existing buildings and how much it would cost to repair those two. 
and what that would leave us with compared with what it would cost and give us for a new building. Other comments? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Hearing none, thank you very much. You've given us uh, a lot of food for thought here. <laughs> And, uh, and appreciate all the work you've been doing on this. Uh, and we're looking forward to uh, the progress that's being made. You've come up with some, actually some, this moved us ahead a good deal, I think. And we appreciate that work. Thank you. Okay, okay good. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Nice to join you. Yep, good to see you. Bye. Thank you. All right, uh, next agenda item are the uh, fiscal 22 budget priorities. Uh, I did meet last night with the finance committee uh, and they made a uh, initial uh, attempt to uh, look at what might be supported, what might not be supported, uh, what's involved. And uh, you got a memorandum from Tim on March 3rd, which lays out the requests. Uh, and I can go down those if you like to at least talk about what the finance committee uh, talked about last night. Uh, and of course, they'll be here in two weeks to uh, do it in more detail and, and maybe get some decisions made. Uh, the first one is the IT manager. Uh, there was significant discussion over whether that needed to be a full-time position or a part-time position initially, uh, what it might cost. Uh, the, the figure put on it tentatively is about $100,000. Uh, and uh, that one they are actually said they were prepared to support. Uh, so that's a good sign. With the, with the understanding that there would be probably offsetting savings by greater efficiencies in other parts of the, of the uh, town government uh, and uh, perhaps even uh, being able to reduce some personnel costs at some point. But the, uh, again, that's all yet to be done. Uh, next is a request by the treasurer's office for seven additional hours of, of a assistant. Uh, and that was talked about either in terms of hiring, of, of increasing hours or bringing on a consultant, which would then not have ongoing uh, obligations. Uh, and that's uh, projected at about uh, $12,000, 11750 something like that. And that's they're prepared to support. Uh, the uh, full-time police officer uh, at about 75,000 plus, uh, question was raised whether that's an offset, whether that, Part of the justification for that is the new law, uh, which requires uh, more training and certification of police officers, which kind of limit it then to full timers. And uh, so the question was, are there, it, would this reduce the number of part timers would need? And John, the feeling was that no, uh, at this point, at least you're not talking about any reduction in part time. But this is, this is a, just a, a full increase of a, of a police officer. Is that correct? Well, the, the no, because the uh, four shifts that are currently each week uh, worked by part-time police officers will be worked by that full-time police officer. We would still keep the numbers there just to do things like old home days, help direct traffic, but they would be taken out of the loop for patrol. Okay. Well, that, that, so I'm, states, glad, I'm glad we got asked that question then. <laughs> states, Is there yeah, four out of five shifts that person would work directly offset what's being done okay. by part-timers. Yeah, that, that was not the understanding of the finance committee. So we probably ought to clear that up with them before. Yeah. And John, do you, John yeah. do you have a sense of what the, what the offset would be? Well, it's the reason I put 75 is that the, the actual cost of that position is probably like hundred thousand dollars. When you talk about training and, um, you know what 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 we actually experience uh with, with a, a full-time officer and you know we have a couple part-time officers that are in the process of leaving right now i probably wouldn't fill those so you know that 75 was a fair number to ensure we had enough money to hire somebody uh, especially somebody that had any kind of an advanced degree um and i i, I think this is I, I think this is where we're going 
I mean, I think the Commonwealth's been pretty clear about that. This legislation's not going away. To be a police officer in the Commonwealth now, you've got to be full-time certified and you have to do everything a full-time officer has to do, um, have to be able to do. And I, 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 you know, and this is probably a bigger discussion, but, um, you know, Carlisle is only going to get so big, you know, we're going to get to the spot. You know, I, I use Lincoln as a go by because they got 4,000 people normally outside the gate and a couple thousand other residents. They tend to be a lot like us, um, you know, Avon. There's a lot of go bys that are around the size and you get to that 13 range, 12, 13 full-time officers. And then that's it. I mean, it's, there's not, there's not probably ever going to be in the next hundred years, more than 13 police officers in Carlisle full-time. But I think the right thing to do- Barry Lynn, are you taking this down? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I know I'm probably sharing something that's gonna get me in the doghouse. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's that's moving in that, in that direction is probably, you know, where we're gonna need to be. But, you know, the, the position is going to um, get us to 11 and then those four shifts um, for the part timers will go away each week. John, when you say 13, you mean FTEs? Are, are we talking bodies or FTEs or what? FTEs? Yeah, but normally that's normally that's 13 people. When you get to 13, then you don't need part timers anymore other than if they're ceremonial or to help direct traffic and things like that they'll no longer patrol anymore you wouldn't have part-time police officers patrolling okay how hey. many you have now john 10 yeah. and then we have 10 part-timers so you would you would decrease your part-timers by two the two people you say that you're that are leaving and then you would hire a new police officer um and are you, is the 75,000 here on Tim's list, is that the net, I mean, not, it's not counting benefits, I understand, but uh, is that the net increase to the police department budget, the, the, you know, the basic operating budget, is that what you're thinking? Yes. Okay, so you've already factored in the savings of the um, not having uh, the part-time shifts. Correct. Okay. Because if you hired somebody for, Sixty-five or seventy thousand dollars a year, then they've got to go to training, and then yeah. um, you know they get two weeks vacation a year, and those that has to be covered with overtime. We don't have any wiggle room right now. If somebody takes a day off, we have to hire somebody overtime. Um, you know, when you offset that with more, then there's less of that, less of the overtime coverage too. Mm -hmm. But the 11 will probably just get us to, that's only really one extra shift a week. So every once in a blue moon, when somebody takes a day off, it'll happen to fall on that police officer's day on and you won't have to hire somebody because we'll already have two. Okay, very good. That's, that cleared up a lot of the questions at least I had last night uh, when this was discussed. Thank you. Uh, next is the Board of Health Public Nurse. Uh, public health nurse, uh, 10 hours, about 16,000 plus, uh, that they, they are prepared to support because that is an offset over, th th there was somebody that we had who was leaving and, but the, the uh, duties remain. Sorry, uh, can, I, can I just ask John a yep. question? <laughs> sorry. Sure, just, go ahead. Yeah. yeah sorry, Chief. When, when was the last time you hired a full-time officer? When, when was the last time this board approved it? Of an increase in the number of police officers here? Yeah, when did we go to 10 from nine? I, I don't remember if it was I, I was on the board or not. Because I know you've been coming. No, with no, no, no. That was back when um, Chief Galvin was here, I believe. I mean, it's, I mean, I've been here 10 years. Oh, and you've never I, got other, other than one year, I've, I've, I've asked you for a police officer every year since I've been here. Yeah. Um, it was, it, my guess is 15 years ago. Okay. Yeah, no, I couldn't remember if we had approved one for you or not, so we haven't, so. No. <laughs> okay, all right, thanks. All right, uh, public health nurse. Uh, again, that's, you may recall, we had one who was grant funded uh, and 
another one that we had part use out of, out of Concord, who isn't going to be here anymore. So uh, that's going to be uh, that, that they're prepared to support. The eight and a half additional hours for the health assistant, uh, they're thinking they may not support that. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, that we're not clear as to uh, in, in the justifications, there seems to be a mix of COVID hours and other kinds of duties that, that aren't COVID related, but it's not clear which are which or how much are. I did ask uh, Tony Marinaro uh, for data on that. I just got an email from him today saying, nobody ever asked me for those numbers, but at the bottom of the email he sent me, I've asked him for those numbers. So uh, I haven't got them at this point. Uh, so at this, at this point, at least uh, the finance committee uh, feels that that's that they're not prepared to support that request uh the coa reorganization uh new positions uh that is a net gain uh but if you don't count fringes uh after fringes i think it's a net loss isn't it tim that, that's that correct Alan. Yeah. yeah yeah because we went from part-timers to full-timers uh uh but it's, it's the kind of thing, and I think part of the reasons they're prepared to support that is that uh, replacing Angela with only two people uh, is probably <laughs> impossible. <laughs> but uh, it's the, uh, and of course they've been working their tails off uh, here. And also we're losing, again, Concord support uh, that we've had in the past. Uh, so there's additional workload coming up uh, for, pe for people, not necessarily aged people, but people under the age of 60 who need social services, which are, which are provided by the Council on Aging. So again, they were prepared to support that. Uh, the, the, there's an additional request, as, we, as you know, we've had a, re a request for increase in salary uh, for town clerk. Uh, we don't know what that number is at this point, and so we need to do a little more work on uh, figuring out what number that would be, uh, even in terms of what the, what the ask is. Uh, and again, COLA is the other big one. Tim, thank you for your analysis. That was very, very helpful uh, for um, me at before least. Before you come to COLA, can I ask you two questions? Yep, one, sure. So you skipped over Conscom or maybe I missed it. Oh, I did not. I did not. Uh, yes, I did skip over Conscom, and they are not prepared to support the Conscom. And what about? Did, do they support the uh, police officer? They did not. They did but not I, but I think part of that was a lack of information, and we'll have to go back and see whether or not, with this additional information, they might be prepared to support it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the the Conscom one looks like it's just a shift from their their intense accounts to their gift fund, right? Right. So that's. That doesn't impact us either way, right? But I, we'd still have to. Who who signs off on their gift fund, Tim? I mean, it doesn't seem like that would be sustainable. But it's just a one year. I think I think I think they they can sign off on their gift fund. The the select board has to sign off on the, the intents. Yeah. So they come they come to you each year to approve the those three hours. Yeah. Well, I'm not clear on that. Um, this is um, moving three hours to um, be covered by what they bring in in fees. Is that it? No, their their gift fund, and I, I'm speaking. I haven't talked with them about this, but being on contact. No, the gift fund is when somebody gives a donation or um, somebody um, pays for like a land use permit. You know, for example, they park at Foss Farm to use that house for filming commercials um on 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 225 there uh so it's really it's kind of an open fund um the intense account is yeah that's that 53 e and a half right or whatever it is that that that's a yeah. portion of of fees right so that the the there's a restriction on the intense that it can only be used for you know wetland related blah blah blahs right but in a three hour you know chunk of time it doesn't really you know, out of a 35 hour week, it, you know, nobody's going to split those hairs. But so, so this one, it seems like they're moving from the intents to this gift fund. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what the logic is. It'd be good to know that. But I, it just doesn't seem like the gift fund would be sustainable. I mean, I don't know how much they have in there, but I think <clears> the, 
the attached document, um, the um, was there one? What yeah. they call this FY22 budget questionnaire that was included in the packet. I mean, there's yep. ton, tons of info here, but if you go down to that one, I'm just looking mm -hmm. at it now because I remember reading that there was some explanation. Um, trying to find it. Yeah, it's, it's number four. Oh, yeah. It says we are not requesting a change in staff hours, but we are requesting that the general fund pay for the three hours a week of the wages for the conservation. Oh, no. GF is general fund. Ah, I gotcha. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's the operating budget. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. General fund. There you go. That's and it's currently funded through the intense account, which is the account that gets, um, yeah, fees, right? Collects right. fees for the wetlands filings. And they're saying there's not enough money in that account to fully fund this in FY22. Yeah, yeah, that, that was that was always an issue. Even when I was on Conscom, that intense account always ran pretty low. Um, so what have they done in the past? Have they just, um, you know, uh, taken it from some other part of their budget? Covered it? Uh, I, I think they've always had enough to make it through the year, it seems yeah. to me. Yeah, I think they were just squeaked. It, 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 you know, the, the thing is, usually what happens is a big filing comes through, you know, so, um, you know, Woodward Village comes through where, you know, there was the stuff over off of uh, Skeleton Road, you know, with the, you know, Riverfront, right? Something always came through that, that managed to bump that up. Um, but see, this is, this is you know, um, one of the things that we always have to be concerned of you know, when somebody says, oh, our, we have an account that'll pay for it, right? It always after a few years. I mean, Conscom has been doing this with this intense account for years, but eventually it ends up in the general fund. Um, you know, so this maybe, you know, we have as a board have to revisit these fees that, that the boards get to use, right? Because we always seem to pay salaries and then it gets transferred from a, an intense account to the general fund. And we always seem to let them keep their intense accounts. So, no, I, I have, in general, no problem with well, the, being paid out of the intense account to do the work that needs to be done for that, because I don't think the general fund should subsidize projects done by in, private individuals in town for getting their, their permitting. Um, so either they're not charging enough then fees in order to cover the work that's needed, or... Um, or they're maybe doing things that they don't need to do. <laughs> and then, you know, and that, I don't want to pay for it, you know, that we don't, anyway. Yeah, it's always tricky. You're, set, you're right with the intense account. Yep. And it's, yep. um, I mean, it is a very small amount. I so. Yeah, but, you know, it's a small amount this year and there's a bigger, you know. Well, it, I'm just saying, yeah. I mean, in terms of, yeah. How much time we spend though, looking into this one is compared to some of the others. Yeah, so, that's true. Yeah. but. FinCom was not in, in favor of this. Alan. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and I think in the past we have not been either in general for gen that general principle. Yeah. FinCom will be coming in two weeks to yeah. have this in more in-depth discussion with us. So uh, these are good questions for us to have ready. And in fact, it's if I'm, I'm happy to pass on those questions to Jim Dar prior, you know to that meeting so he has time to think about it and how he might want to answer it yeah with with the it manager can we get a more solid cost yes uh that, that number came from asking uh it people uh what it would cost to get the kind of person but i don't think i mean i'm not sure they even had a job description at that point yeah. uh we're, we're still putting that together yeah uh, my, my concern and i don't know and i have no idea what scott makes is you know, he the we, we shouldn't. The, pardon me. Is he the school guy? The school guy. Yeah, yeah. School yeah. Guy. I, I, yeah I never remember. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different job, yeah. uh, but it's the, uh, but it's the kind of thing. And of course, and the other question comes up: Do we need a, do we need a full time person right off the bat, uh, or can we do this incrementally? Yeah. Uh, right. And so those are things to think about uh, as we talk about that. I mean, I think there's, you know, I, you know clearly, I was one of the main proponents of establishing this position. So I'm, I'm going to continue to do so. Uh, but I, I, I have in mind, which, uh, you know, we have a little committee 
uh, dealing with this. And I have in mind what that type, what the type of person ought to be and, and what they got. And I, and I think that estimate is a little bit high from what it would cost us to bring somebody in for looking at what, for instance, we hire at the college to do desktop support and uh, for training and that sort of thing, which I think is the immediate need. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think another thing too is, you know, we need to make sure that position has a little pot of money <laughs> so they can actually be effective when they first come in. Right. Because if, yeah. if, if they have no money to update infrastructure and, and those sorts of things, um, yeah. So we just, we have to factor that in as well. Yeah. Because I think, yeah, this just seems to me like it's going to be a position that's going to cost more initially and then kind of as things happen, it'll, it'll, yeah. it'll cost. But it could have big impacts on efficiency. Oh, without a doubt. No, I'm not, I don't disagree yeah. with the position. No, 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 not at all. I mean, I, I'm looking at, you know, I'm Kim and Priscilla and Peggy, I mean, just running flat out with, for things which could be pretty easily automated. Yeah. And, and Kim's been doing a lot of that anyway, uh, but it's still, uh, the, the workload is too high in there. There's no question about it. And, and part of it is getting appropriate software, getting appropriate software support uh, to automate some of, some of these functions. Yep, no, I agree. You know, the other thing that uh, came up at the um, finance committee last night was, um, and, and also they've stated this before in, in previous meetings recently that um, their general approach this time around is to think about a level service budget again. And, um, you know, as I've been thinking about it, um, I, for some of these requests, which are, you know, additional hours, um, I, you know, I, th I think in general, we don't want to add hours or positions unless we know that that is the solution that because you know once we add something it's very hard to to change that right it's it stays there if anything it may grow um and that i before we immediately sort of put new resources toward trying to solve some of the um issues that people have raised. Uh, I would like to see us look at the, or, or maybe this is something that Tim is doing with a, with a few others, uh, but look at the staff organization and figure out, you know, what's the work that needs to be done? How's it currently organized? Uh, and have we, have we got the resources in place and the, um, the people in place to be as productive as possible. And that that kind of um, uh, research or that kind of um, outlook and I think is really important to do um, to figure out how we get the sort of best possible return on the investment that taxpayers are making, you know, in our town services and I, I don't know that we have that right now in terms of the way um, jobs are structured and who's responsible for what and um, that, that we've, we've figured, we've looked at that first before we go to um, adding more hours um, or positions. I'm just wondering what other people think about that. I think it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I was going to say, you're uh, not going to get any pushback from me. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the, <laughs> the, the idea, I mean, more, more hours without more services yeah. doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. I mean, it, it, you know, it's one thing if the, if the workload has increased incrementally over several years so that the existing staffing le levels can no longer provide existing services and which case you have to say, okay, which services aren't being provided anymore, uh, then new positions, you know, then you can justify adding hours. Uh, but if you're, if you're adding hours without proposing additional services to be provided, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And that's why, that's why I asked Board of Health for the data, you know, yeah. which 
and and then there's always the question of you know when when you're feeling you know really tight and you need those hours is it because it's just a one-off thing where you really should have called a consultant you get the job done it's off your desk uh you know it's, it's a one-time uh expense and then we don't have it on our books for the rest of our lives as, as they're doing with cares reimbursement yes yeah yeah well and, and then the other piece of that is you know we've talked about this in the past but i don't know that we have that we have it yet and tim you could certainly speak to this which is the ability for you know staff to um who who may be at the moment not as have as much work and able to pitch in um, to help out in another area where there's a, a significant increase in the workload for the time being. You know, that kind of, um, what do you call that kind of shared? Um, Hot desk. <laughs> Hot desk. <thing. laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I don't know, Tim, what, what you, you obviously know far better the, the overall, um, workings of the staff at town hall and um you know whether we, whether we've got the clear you know job descriptions and everybody knows everybody's working up to their you know best and they have the the support and resources they need to do the very best and um what would you say? Yeah, no, we started looking at, at, at some of that, especially in the area of shared resources between departments and where there's no sort of clear lines of uh, authority and how to kind of uh, uh, get that buy-in from the individual board so that they're uh, willing to share their resources. There's a little bit of, you know, siloing or, you know, people feeling like my, what mine is mine and what's yours is yours. And uh, you know, never the twain shall meet. I think most departments actually work pretty well when there's a need. You know, we 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 have people that pitch in and work uh, cooperatively with other departments. You know, sometimes personalities enter into it. Uh, but we we're, we're talking about well, changing the bylaw, giving the personnel director, the town administrator, more authority to to direct those resources. But the key is having the the boards buying in and telling their employees, you know, you take your your marching orders from uh, the town administrator. And if you've got a, a problem, if you think he's doing something that's totally wrong headed, come to us and we'll, you know, hash it out with him. But otherwise you should be, you know, working more or less at the town administrator's direction because he knows where or should know where the resources ought to be directed. So we are kind of you know, trying to work in that direction and, and making, you know, some changes going forward you know, even at this town meeting. Yeah. yeah, not only that, but he should know what the selectmen, select board's um, goals and priorities of goals are. And if you work in counter, if your board or committee, even if it's an elected one, are working counter to that, we need to have a conversation together and get, you know, everybody pulling the wagon in the same direction right. at that point. So it's not a matter that select board wants to control everything, but it's one way for us to find out what the heck is happening in town also, you know, and, and to protect in certain respects, the employees who are at the mercy of, you know, their boards in certain respects. And then if somebody, the board turns over and suddenly they want something totally different, the employees like, you know, who, who is he supposed to, you know, be beholden to? Who, who's he supposed to be listening to? So it's, it was, it's a very naughty and cop, K-N-O-T-T-Y, naughty and complicated um, problem because of the, the way that town, it's not just our town, uh, towns are organized. Yeah, I, I think we came out of that process, you know, agreeing that we should appoint some kind of group that meets an open meeting to um, come up with the best way to go forward on this. Yeah. Um, and so we are gonna do that. I don't know when we're taking that up, but at some point we need to do that. Um, but just, I wanna you know, build on Kate's comments and, and Tim's. One is <clears throat> there is an unresolved issue when you have an elected board, a different elected board, there's nothing in the world that says the select board is in charge of all the other elected boards. I mean, certainly in my time in 
you know, school committee, I would not have agreed with that statement. <laughs> um, so we have to be respectful that each of the elected boards has an agenda and they were presumably elected to carry out that agenda. Um, that notwithstanding, most of the time, the employees are just doing routine stuff that they already know how to do that really doesn't have day-to-day -day relevant, well, relevance might not be the right word, but that doesn't directly tie day-to-day -to, -day to some sort of strategic, you know, edict from a, from a board. So most of the hard work falls, you know, on the staff and Tim as the organizer. And so there should be a structure that allows for that to be run more efficiently, not the least of which is simply cross training so that, you know, people can do more things and they're more flexible because we're a small town and people have to do, be flexible. So, you know, we support all of that stuff. And then at the board level, it's incumbent on us as a select board, I think, and those other elected boards to, you know, to reach an understanding where potential conflicts lie and how we resolve those or at least understand each other. And to date, I want to say that we've worked quite well with those other boards right now. We're working with planning and health um, and, and school pr pretty effectively, I guess, in my opinion, by listening to what they have to say and trying to make sure that everybody's priorities are met. So um, my takeaway is that we should we should appoint this this committee, I guess, to review exactly how it would work. And then we should move toward that back, going back now to Barney's point, we should really move, we are, we hoping to move to a, you know, more um, sophisticated and flexible system, which would try to re, you know, try to make it more efficient. That doesn't mean we're not going to need things like an IT manager, but at least, you know, in the day-to-day -day work, hopefully we'll get to a better spot. Do you, do you envision this committee as a committee of the select board or no. outside people? I mean, people who know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that one. I think <laughs> one or two select. Kate and I have been working with uh, other board members from other boards and with Tim on this for a little while. And yep. have actually had some people from other towns come in and tell us how they organize and we're doing some other coordination. Kate's done a lot of work in that area and Madeline Blake at planning. Um, so I think there'd be representation on the boards and then there would be some outside people and it would be public. I think it's no, we don't want to do this under cloak of darkness. So we want to make sure that it's participative and we bring in that we, whoever's on it brings in uh, people as needed experts, you know, to get best practices and we come out you know, before we roll it out, we have a thoughtful process where we've heard inputs from others. Okay, thank you. We, we have a Collins report already from 2013 yep. that uh, we could start with. Um, and um, it, there's, there's a lot of models out there and it basically, you, you know, decide, you know, are the elected boards that we currently have elected, should they still be elected? Should they be appointed? Should they, you know, I, what are other towns doing? Do we want to keep this model? Do we want to do something else? Okay. It looks at all those governance issues. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, a thing Tim Harrington coined the phrase, I think, and I, I love it, is the night government and the town government and the day government. And it's really, you know, it's, it, it's not really, it's not fair to the day government to always have to worry about conflicting priorities in the night government. And it's not fair for the night government to have to probe down into the bowels of how you organize the day government and be the effectively manager of those people. That's a big job, big part of what Tim is chartered to do. Yep. Is it, should we, should we appoint this committee imminently? Yeah, I think we should, you know, it doesn't have to be tomorrow, but I think the next meeting or two, we should probably right. be thinking about, um, come, with, come with names who might serve on it, at least initially. Yeah, I think, Kate, we should, in our next little group meeting, we should probably query the people to get some names. Yeah, charter, a charter and names and, you know, yeah. yeah. All righty. Tim, put, uh, if you can put that on as a uh, possible agenda item for you, you, you think in two weeks or wait till 
Yeah, I think I think the twenty third is fine. Okay, good. Yeah. Hey, when's our next? I am just looking <laughs> to see when our next small group meeting is. Is the nineteenth or something? Nineteenth. Yeah. Right. So we so we, we should be we ready. Should, we should push that request out to everybody for that meeting so we can get right. Okay. That'd be good. Tim, could would you mind doing that? Sure. Telling them that yep. we're going to have okay. Yeah. All right. Should we move to Koa? Sure. <sighs> All right. Uh, Tim gave us a, quite a nice analysis of uh, what's going on in COA, both historically and in the last uh, couple of years, uh, and even made a recommendation, which uh, I thought was wonderful. Uh, but what does the board think? Oh, hang on. Let me try to get. And, and I'll. While you're th thinking, Kate, I'll, I'll also say, to to what degree are we obligated to do COA as a percentage? Tim, that's a question to you, I think. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I, I don't think that you you're uh, obligated to a percentage. I, I don't know what uh, how you might want to al allocate it, but I don't think you're well, you know certainly uh, uh, with the uh, non-union uh, employees you can uh, do that a number of different ways. This this is uh, the data that I presented is typically what the personnel board would look at in making their recommendation. Yeah. They, uh, they weren't uh, able to meet, so I, my, my bias is I am I am against percentage callers for the very reason that it unfairly increases the disparity between the highest paid and the lowest paid employees of the town. Uh, I like dollar amounts, more equitably distributed. Uh, that, and you can certainly look at the, at the uh, bundle of money you distribute in terms of a percentage of the current salary base, but it, uh, uh, my own biases, and I, and I don't, I mean, it's, it is that percentage increases is, is patently unfair uh, because it, it, it gives people with the highest salary levels the biggest increases and the people with the lowest levels the, the smallest increases when it probably ought to be the other way around. But that's, you know, I, I just throw that out there because we had a pause in thinking. <laughs> And actually, I, I completely agree with you, Alan. Yeah, I, I, I agree as well. Sorry, I'm sorry, Barney. Were you done? <laughs> okay. Go for it. Okay. No, I agree as well. I just, I, the only thing, I don't know how you do that without performance reviews. You know, that's, you know. Oh, but, you do it, you can do it as simply as a function of salary. Yeah. 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 It's, it's not, it's not a, it's not a performance bonus. No, it's, I it's know. It's a cost of living adjustment well, yeah. oh i see you're just doing it specifically as as that that's what cola stands for yeah yeah no i know yeah i guess it and you know that's how it's built into the union contracts right? yeah it's strictly a cost of living it, it is but we could certainly do it you know start changing it little by little especially right. if you've changed it for a non-union um oh, i mean i mean i think on you know, we could look at the non-union. Uh, it would be interesting to look at the non-union total compensation and what what would happen if you took two percent of that and then figured out a way to distribute it differently. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, you know, I, I think we, yeah. You, know, uh, you have some people in. A, you know, I'm, I'm going to use Priscilla as an example, right? Above and beyond every year every year right um you know and and i like somebody like that of course obviously she's retiring unfortunately but you know somebody like that i would want to make sure that that the that her her cola you know is i, I see where you're coming from but i don't know i'm maybe yeah, i'm well more, the way you the way you do it what you know i mean i happen to know this system works because i've used it for years yeah. uh you 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 take your salary aggregate, you, whatever money you're going to do for what, what would have been in a cost of living adjustment on a percentage basis. Yeah. You allocate 
a certain amount of it as a cost of living adjustment. And then, and there's, and there's another pers- yeah. bunch of money you do for performance. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. And, and that's, well, that's, that's routinely do done that. in, in industry all the time. Yeah, no, exactly. it's, yeah, it is, but we don't, I mean, I guess we have to first calibrate where we are. Right. So the teachers get the COLA as a percentage of salary, and then they get steps and lanes for growth. I don't know that there's particularly rewards for exceptional performance, but generally speaking on the town side, unless they move into a different wage class, it doesn't matter if they've done an extraordinary, the COLA is the raise, right? And there are I think they get steps. steps. Yeah, one step every third year and the COLA annually, right? Okay. That's the only way you right. So I mean, we do have the larger issue. If we're going to move to a performance-based evaluation, that's its own thing, right? That's a whole big. Effort. Right. We should do it, but that's. Well, we are moving to, in that direction. We are. Right. Right. But the de out. facto, <laughs> unless somebody is, I guess I'm trying to understand. We don't really have a mechanism at the moment to reward exceptional or to de, de- reward or whatever you know, poor performance, right? Within a range, I mean, generally speaking, our town people work pretty hard and we pay them this thing we call COLA, which is effectively the increase they get, right? Yep. So I'm not against switching. I guess it's a transition. So then this year, yeah, we could move to the Allen style, but just understand it's it's not really a COLA, it's, combination of the cola and a bump i guess i don't know I mean, it's an, you know it's a cola and incentive based right uh, no it's just a, it's just a redistribution of wealth <laughs> <laughs> which is go. i hate you know god i probably get crucified for saying that but it's a it's a it's a way to keep the rich from getting richer and the poor from getting poorer right. And, yeah. and it's, it's just, just that simple. I, think, I No, I think it makes yeah. a lot of sense. More what progressive. You're yeah, it's a pro- yeah. More progressive way of um, yeah. Re- yeah, paying your yeah. employees. I mean, when you, you know, not, not that it happens in this town, but you know, when, you, when you have people who are making $350,000 a year and people who are making $35,000 a year, and you give both of them a 2% increase, yeah. a whole lot of difference in money. Yeah. 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 All right. So what do we do about this? The COLA, by the way, goes both to our salaried and our hourly employees. Is that correct or no? Well, the, the, the contractual employees have, have it built into their agreement. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, that might be But it's all, all the non-union, yeah. It's employees. just really the- Depart- Department heads and, and uh, their assistants, uh, administrative assistants, it's really just the non-union folks, everyone else. Okay. So it's really town hall that we're talking about and- a few, well, then there's some DPW. The and library. library. And yep. library. Um, so nobody actually is making, you know, a whole lot of money in that whole group. Right? I mean, <laughs> if you think about it. What's the salary range, would you say? Yeah. What's the, if you're comparing full-time employees? I'm not sure. It, it, well, what do you, you mean think? The split the, between the two? What's no? What's the like? What's the, the sort of lowest salary for a full-time employee? And what do you think the highest salary is? I'm just interested in the range that we're paying. Uh, Roughly. Yeah, probably like thirty-five or forty to about a hundred in some cases. A few people. Mm-hmm. Have, Hundred thousand or so, ninety five mm-hmm. or a hundred, something like that. Yeah. Well, so that is a big split. I mean, thirty five to forty, and then ninety five and hundred is like double. So double that. Um. All right. Well. Okay, food for thought. Yeah. yeah. It is, and I, I'd like to make a decision. Well, I uh, don't know that we can move to this to impact this next um, fiscal year budget because it feels like it's the kind of thing that needs more thought and discussion 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but it also, said, but also, and from a budgetary standpoint, it's irrelevant. Yeah. You're still talking about the same amount of money on the budget. Right. Right. That's it's just true. That you'd give the, the top people one and a half percent and the bottom people three percent or whatever. Right. Yeah. You know? Right. Yep. But the the total amount you're paying out will stay the same. Yeah. And, you, yeah. And, you, and that's and that's the number we have to deal with. What's right. the you know if if right. if we if we give a two percent cola, what does it cost the town? The way we do it now. Right. If we give a one and a half percent cola, what does it cost the town? You know, the, the, that yeah. that's a simple number to calculate. Right, right. Yeah, I think it's about seventy thousand for two percent, something like about thirty-five thousand percent. Okay. Thirty-five thousand yeah. percent. I have to relearn that number every year. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I also think if the um, if the union employees are getting um, two percent, right. that it's um, you know, I think par there is uh, some importance to parity, at least for n at this point. Yeah. With, you know, how things have been, how we've been operating. Yep. Yes. So I would, uh, do you want a, a motion to, um, to preserve the equity among town union and non-union employees to um, ask for a 2% adjustment uh, for all town staff at all levels uh, for the fiscal 22 wage adjustment. Well, you can make the motion and we can discuss it. I just made the motion. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, discussion. You I'd like to move to something else, but I think for this year, um, we should mm -hmm. do this and maybe, um, I don't know how we move, you know, let people know down the line that that's the last time we're gonna do that. And that um, we're gonna be, you know, checking the, the um, we'll be hanging tougher on the colas for the, you know, in our yeah. negotiations with the unions down. I there. mean, well, right. So you're bringing up, you're bringing up three different things, right? So one is the parity issue right now, which I do agree with. It's always been a principle of ours. And the 2%, if you think about parity, having been in those negotiations myself, we've worked pretty hard as a town to try to keep the colas in the union, in the collective bargain agreements at that reasonable number, which you can see from Tim's data. So it goes both ways. We've kind of done the third thing, what you said, we've, we, we, and we can continue to signal to the collective groups that um, it's not just a rubber stamp of money and we're being, whatever we do for those groups, we're gonna be fair to the non-bargaining unit employees. So that's a good you know, equity principle. The, the, the middle piece, I think we should have a second motion, a different motion, which says, which commits us to moving to a performance evaluation system such that if we, you know, when we get to this point again, a year from now, there's a framework and I was going to mention, you know, in the in the corporate side, to Alan's point, you would give a department head a pot of money, and you'd say divide that, you know, among your staff in proportion to what you feel they deserve. But you can't do that unless you also have a pretty well understood and you've done it, you know, performance system. So I guess I I support the motion. Um, but I would like another motion, I guess, to you know commit us to kind of moving to the next. To move to the next step requires us to do something. You can't just say it. Other discussion? I just want to say that Barney and I and Tim have been moving towards this evaluation system um, as rapidly as we think we can. Um, and I think, so that has been a signal to the staff that that is happening. Um, we would. What happened to our, 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 wait, when we were talking about the budget thing, we, yeah, I thought we had an HR person, part-time HR person on the, in our budget request, um, because that was the idea was that uh, we're going to be much more stringent about keeping the records and you know, making sure the evaluations actually happen and that they not only happen once a year, they happen quarterly so that people both, you know, get encouragement and, 
training and, you know, um, whatever they need to become successful. Um, anyway. Well, Tim, you should I... speak to that. I think you may have said something at FinCom, yeah. but I don't know that you've said anything here. <laughs> I, I, I made, I made a, a, a choice that I decided I, I wanted the full-time IT manager more than, and I would continue to do the HR myself. I guess that was uh, where I came down at the, it was clear that the, the FinCom was not going to support both positions. And when forced to choose, I, I chose the IT position. So I guess that's what happened to that one. Well, it was in the context of an assistant town administrator with an HR specialty. And I acknowledge that that might be something that they'd be more comfortable uh, you know, doing uh, in a future budget year uh, rather than this year. I do think the IT is a pressing need. And I'm, Pleased that they're supporting it. Okay. All right, we, we have a motion on the table and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote. Arnold, I. Was that, was that a pro or a con? <laughs> that was a. <laughs> you won't stand it. Did you vote for it? Yeah. I did. Arnold I. Oscar Lillo I. Lewis I. Lord I. Reed I. Thank you. Okay. So, David, you want to make your second motion or? Yes. Uh, let me see if I can do this. I move that the select board, in conjunction with uh, Town Administrator Goddard, commit to a develop a performance evaluation framework uh, for fiscal year starting with fiscal year 22 uh, with clear guidelines and um, an, an agreed upon process. I guess. Thank you. Well, uh, do you want to tie that to money? Because that would be then. Um... Yeah, are you, are you? Sure, sure. I, I would tie that to money. Right. Okay, with the end goal, with the end goal, let me try that again. I move that the select board in conjunction with town administrator Goddard, commit to a developing and instituting a performance evaluation process for fisc for town employees, fis non bargaining unit town employees, fiscal 22 and beyond, such that the future increases, including COLA, are allocated based on that performance evaluation process. Merit, whatever, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay, discussion? I think well, we're what, well on our way. <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah. I just, so um, to me that means um, that a, a group, and maybe it's a continuation of the group that already exists, but is going to come back with a with a sort of a, a timeline and a a process for how you figure that out. How you figure out what that it, it's two things. It's the we're, we're we're on our way in terms of a of a, you know performance evaluations with the work that um, Tim and. Kate and I and Mark Way have done, and um, and in addition to that being concluded and providing, you know, a tool for those performance evaluations, we're also talking about um, developing um, some kind of formula for how the the money would be allocated that would um, from a cola increase. Is that right? I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. not trying to restate your motion. Just want to understand it's both the evaluation process and the uh, how the money would be allocated. Compensation, yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, so, right. So I think I, I generally agree with what you said, and I'll just say it in my way, which is, yeah, we, we've already done, you guys have done particularly a lot of goal setting. So staff is beginning to understand the process by which goals are set at, you know, at some point and that the progress against those goals is measured. So that's in place. So, you know, the beginnings of that are in place already. 
The second piece is there should be some sort of standard process form, whatever, which I'm sure we can query similar towns and uh, get that's some that. ideas, you know, but there's the form. Already, right? so, yeah, yeah, that's already done. All right, yeah, great. We, this group has already been working on that. And it's already, yeah. so, yeah. so then, so then that has to be, so then the third piece, I guess, is, and again, maybe you've done all this, is now starting with fiscal 22. So starting in, you know, July, the department heads or whatever should sit down with their staffs and there should be some dialogue about goal setting, which is noted in, in writing. And then there's some review process of reviewing that, which sounds right. like you're there. Right. And then the last piece is, okay, in the future, we're gonna take that pot of money and we're gonna, in some fashion, and we don't have to decide it ahead of time, we're gonna allocate that based on um, uh, merit or uh, you know uh, metrics against stated and agreed upon goals. And, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel on this. I mean, this, this is no, just it's out, used right, it's out all over the place. Yeah, of right. course, of course. Right. And to me, the only variable is whether you say, here, Tim, here's a pot of money you divide, or you That's, know, we go department by department and we sort of allocate a slice and we give it to those administrators or the boards or whatever and get them to, that still is open in my mind. Yeah, okay. And then the rest would go across the board. You know, right. could take half a percent or whatever, you know. Right. You know, you put a range, Positive one to three, you put a one to three yeah. percent. Uh, you know, it depends if we want to go full, full uh, communism or socialism. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, David, you just gave the headline for the mosquito article. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I could see, I could see a range, you know, one to three or whatever percent and guide or guidelines, some method. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah. We don't need to solve that problem here. Right, right, right. right. Yep. Yeah, and I, I would like just to have it sort of noted that, um, you know, our little working group has talked about the importance of um, discussing uh, all of this with not just department heads, but with all the town hall staff and really yeah. engaging them in un not just understanding, but giving feedback uh, about how all this will work and that um, it's also going to be really important to, um, you know, provide some training or at least coaching for people that have not been used to using the kind of uh, performance evaluation uh, form and process that we're talking about implementing. So that I think that's a, I, I feel strongly that, you know, as a select board, we should really support that and make sure that um, Tim and others have the resources to do that. I agree. Okay. All right. Anything further on uh, budget priorities? We have to vote that. Are oh, that one. It? Right. Yes. Do we have a second? Yep. We had I a think second. I seconded it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Any further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none. Roll call vote. Arnold, I. Hospital, Illinois. <laughs> Mo Lewis, I. Modell, I. Reed, I. Thank you. So um, I don't, going back um, a topic of you know, all the budget priorities, did we really, dis I mean, we heard what the FinCom supported and didn't support. Did we discuss what we support and don't support? Nope. No. And are, do we want to tonight or was that for another night? You can do it either way. We're gonna have to do it in two weeks. Well, I think we should do it well. Well, we could start the conversation tonight and see, you know, where we. Well, I think we should see where we have agreement and where we don't. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's, I think that's the key. So that so that the FinCom. I mean, right. Remember last year, we. Yes. <laughs> yes. We don't want to do that again if we can help it. But right. Right. A, uh... And we have a lot more. Okay. Yeah. So if we go back to Tim's memo. Yeah. I think we're all in agreement of for. Well, I don't want to talk, but is I, but I certainly uh, am in, in favor of supporting the IT manager. I agree. Are we straw polling or what? What is the well, yeah? I mean, sure. yeah. Are we in, okay? I mean, you, you, we, I don't. You don't want to vote on these tonight. No. Well, I don't think well, we have I to vote on them. I don't think yeah. we should yet. Um, with the with the IT manager um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm generally, uh, I'm very much in support of having um, that uh, set of skills and capability and, and um, you know, teaching education or whatever you want to call it for the, for the staff. Um, I, um, I don't know what we can get uh, for a part-time IT person, although from a financial standpoint, it's, you know, it would be nice to, if we thought we could get somebody that could meet our, those basic needs and really make a difference in terms of um, um, efficiencies uh, that we could try we that. But I, I suspect that to get somebody of the caliber or with the skill set that at least they were discussing at the FinCom last night may not be something we can get on a part-time salary. Yep. You may be right. Well, I mean, the part-time salary would have to be part-time hours too. Uh, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. In which case I'd want to have my part-time uh, HR person back. <laughs> 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 well, if they're willing to, you know, well, anyway. Yeah. Well, again, that I mean the the dollar number there is, is a, just a right. guess. Uh, yeah. That's still got to be worked out. We're still working on the job description, that sort of yeah. thing. So, yeah. so and I think and, it'd be I helpful think, too. I mean, sorry, Kate. Right, no, go ahead. I, I think I don't know how much you can do this without having somebody specifically there understanding what we have and what we could change. But it would be helpful in making the case for this position to be able to have more detail on what efficiencies, what programs, what technology changes uh, might be possible um, and, and therefore what that would mean for the overall functioning of town hall. Yep. And I, and I think part of the problem there is, is I think we, I mean, ideally that would come from the town hall personnel who need those efficiencies. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure at this point that that's possible. Yeah, no. In fact, I think that was some one of the the uh, departments has goals was to, to get that, and then she realized she really didn't have the expert. She just she didn't even know which what questions to ask, and uh, so she you know no we need we. But we might get help from another town or two. Yeah. In saying you know, you yeah. know I mean every town's got one of these except us. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's well, al almost every town has one except us. One, one does not that I queried, but uh, the, uh, I mean, the, they know what the, what the benefits of this are, and we just need to get them to tell us what they are, uh, yeah. and then we can write the appropriate job description. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be good. But we, but we have some really basic needs at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think are we all in favor? at least in mm -hmm. concept of the IT person. Right? Yes. Okay, treasurer assistant. This one I had some questions on. Um, we're going to get, you know, I think there's going to be some reorganization in that department uh, because we're getting going to have a new accountant. I think there's, uh, we're, I should back up and say, I think there should be some reorganization in that department. <laughs> Um, at one point, um, I think um, Carrie had hired somebody that she thought she would train up to be kind of a, a, an assistant treasurer and who, you know, um, could be maybe succession, you know, good for succession. And I don't think that's necessarily working out, um, which I think is also demanding part of where the, some of the demand for these hours is happening. And um, so I'm not willing really um, to, to give extra hours to somebody else as a workaround to somebody who may not be up to the job. So I, that's. Okay. Yeah, um, that's, and, and I, you know, I would like to see, that's part of my comment about sort of looking at who is responsible for what and um, is that organized in the best possible way and um, I'm, I don't, I think taking a look at that and figuring out if there are better ways to yeah. use the existing staff, it, 
that's what I would prefer we do first. Yeah, and because I, I worry that that's going to lock us in then, and then we'll get a new account, and then now we're stuck. Uh, you know, um, we have no wiggle room anymore. All right. The uh, and I will say, uh, based on last night's meeting, I mean the, the the enthusiasm for this particular request comes from a couple of people. Uh, and nobody challenged them. Well, I'll admit that. Uh, but uh, there's there's a strong feel. I'm not sure that the justification given by in the in the budget justification is the same reason that the people are being enthusiastic about adding these hours. Okay. Yeah. But that's something we can. That's a discussion we probably should have with FinCom next week, two weeks. That, that we have questions about that, it, you know, and they may well say, you know, hey, we're, we're happy to not support a position that you don't feel is necessary. It's not that I don't feel it's usually the other way around. I, it's, it's not that I don't think. <laughs> yeah. No, I understand. Yeah. I just think that it's a workaround around something and it's, it, yeah. and it's the wrong way to go. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Okay. So I will put a question mark on that one. And, and yeah. Everybody seems to be agreement on this, that one. Okay. I'm in favor, of course, of, uh, at this point of the full-time police officer, but. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, based on the, the re, uh, the, the, the more information we got tonight, I, have, I could have a little different take on it that than I had last night where I was told that it, it didn't have any reductions in personnel, it was just adding another body. Yeah, well, I um, there's that, but there's also the fact that we're going to lose more part timers um, because of the new law. And Probably, yeah. I was at an MIA thing, I forget. And anyway, it was clear that part timers aren't going to, we're not going to be able to keep any part timers. All right. that, that'll be a big one for discussion. Yeah. yeah. yeah but I mean, it does go to, I don't, I'm not sure where I sit on it, but it, it does go to the strategic priorities of the town. I mean, if you look at the list, 100,000 for the, I, I mean, we all generally agree, you know, we have to get with the 21st century in IT, so. But that's a big ticket. This is the second big ticket. And then we're saying no or questionable to a whole pile of these little guys, which, you know, and I'm not here to advocate, say, for Board of Health, for example, but they could say, well, geez, you know, I'm looking for eight hours of somebody and I got this whole list of reasons and you say no to that, but you know, something that costs five times as much, you just say fine. And you know, is, is like law and order or security or safety, whatever it is that that police officer represents, is that more important than our health function? And I'm not here to say one way or the other, but that's a reasonable strategic question for us to deal with at a high level. But that's not the, that's not the question. The question is, what is the justification for this particular request? If it, yeah. if, it in, if it increases our ability to deliver public health, then it's probably worthwhile. If it doesn't, based on the justification, yeah. then, you're, then there's no reason to give the money. Yeah. For instance, I'm totally in support of the 16,000 for the public health nurse. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I guess my question always is what happens if we don't spend this money? on the police officer. We, it we, will probably cost us a big chunk of that because we'll be paying overtime pay for, uh, for, you know, ex other people to fill in. I mean, the other thing is that, you know, this law is being phased in over several years. Uh, hmm. And what, and I, one of the things that, one of the things I think the FinCom talked about last night is, is this the year that it's necessary? Yeah, okay. Right. Well, and do we, I've never really gotten satisfaction. I don't think John's on anymore, but I know that we have to have at least two officers for every shift. So, you know, there's 21 shifts in a week and people have vacations and stuff. So you've got to have X yep. people, right? So you can always have two people, but I'm always surprised, not always, but I'm surprised occasionally how many officers there are in the daytime. And you know, we're not a high crime town and I'm not saying we should be complacent or anything like that. But the fact is there's an awful lot of people on the daytime shift. And, and have we really 
probed that and said, you know, should we have to have two people every shift? So we get that. But beyond that, do we need people in the daytime? Do we need a third or a fourth or fifth? Do we need that? And I've never been satisfied with that answer from the police force, I have to say. Again, I'm not against it or for it, but I don't know if we've done the level of analysis. We're, you know, we're analyzing the we're analyzing to the nth degree what the Board of Health is asking, and maybe that's the right thing to do. But we ought to apply that same logic to the to the police. I agree with that. Yeah. So that's a question. I would say it's a question. Yeah. Yep. All right. Public health nurse. I'm in favor yep. of that. Now my Thank understand you. and so Alan, at the beginning when you um described this, I believe you said this is um these are hours that we have been receiving and they're being eliminated um, because of grants ending and Concord not uh, providing the person anymore. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So to meet the need for the services we have been providing, we need to... Um, yeah, just for level service. Yeah. So I would support this one position. Okay. I would too. Yeah. Okay. Board of Health, 8.5 additional hours for the health assistant. I think everybody knows where I stand on this one. <laughs> and you know, gosh, I mean, nobody, nobody would uh, question, you know, how hard the Board of Health has been working around the pandemic. No. But you know, they've made very clear a number of times that this is not COVID-related request, and that's the part that I think um, makes me, yeah. you know, I'm I'm not similarly to the other extra hours requests. And I will. I will press Tony on getting more quantitative data. Uh, I, mean, I, I was a little surprised at, at his response is that we, we haven't been asked for the numbers when, when the paragraph below that statement, I've asked for the numbers. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so I will I will go back to him. I, I just saw that, he, I just got that late this afternoon when I was busy doing other stuff. And so I didn't get a chance to respond to him, but I will do that. Yeah try to get information for us before the next meeting. Yeah, and I have to say um, in their um, presentation to the FinCom, uh, the fact that they gave a, a, a chart, you know, that graph of, you know, who's getting what in which department, it's like, mm, yeah, you know, well, she's getting a bigger bedroom than I'm getting and, you know, <laughs> an extra window <laughs> or whatever. It's like, uh, no, that's not the way we're looking at it. Right. I don't think it's the way we should be looking at it. Nope. And also, I I wondered, you know, looking at some of the justification, like describing, you know, having a big um, development come along, whether that isn't something that they should be looking. Okay, if if they really do get in a big crunch, why not consider, you know, finding, you know, hiring somebody just to deal with that particular uh, big project, um, rather than right. And, and the this, is, this person doesn't go out and inspect these places. This is the right. this is the purple process of the paper. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So, I, it seems like we're all in agreement on this one that to hold off for now. Yeah. Okay. Conscom. As yeah. much as I love Conscom, no, I. No. It's another one. Yes. This is the stuff yeah. that needs to stop. You know, it it. it it's the pro oh, we'll just, just, you know, we need more hours and look, we're paying for stuff out of the intense account. And then all of a sudden, you know, I mean, it, it always happens. And this is where it seems to me that Tim should be able to shift resources around, you know, give them three hours here and four hours there. And, you know, and to, you know, if somebody is not asking for, I don't know, it seems to me there might be some of that stuff that could be done by a, a floater. So I get, the, I get the idea this is not getting universal support. Yeah, no. Okay. COA reorganization. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I support that. Can we get the the cost of the benefits though? Because this is, this is, we're basically adding one. Yeah, she, uh, she did, have, there, there is a sheet that she does that. I, I don't have it in front of me at the moment. Uh, is that what she sent a while back? It is, yes. Okay. Yeah, it was, but it was a it was a second reorganization. I mean, okay. it was the initial one, and then she refigured things after because people got 
uh, first snow board upgraded some people yeah. that changed their salaries. Uh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think, you know, um, <laughs> I wish we could have done it when, when Angela yeah. was here. But, and, uh, yeah, yeah, the other one, the uh, town clerk uh, right. is not, well, yeah. I mean, that's nothing we have to discuss here in public. That's simply a, something we do. Uh, I mean, Tim's kind of in charge of that. And, but, we, and, but we'll need to, but we'll need to get approved. We'll need to get, we'll get approved. We have to prove it. Yeah. And then it goes before it goes on the town warrant. Probably has to go on the warrant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm just glad that we kind of went through this so that. Yep. Yeah. Have a sense of well, it's good. Yep. So I, I would say we're on board with the FinCon more or less as well. Pretty much. We have a couple of places. We just need more information. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, Tim, was there anything more in the administrator's report? No, we went. No, I just said, uh, I think just to schedule the upcoming meetings, but yep, no okay, very substantive good. items. Yep. All right. Liaison reports. Uh, excuse me, Alan, before we do that, just on the select board agendas. So um, wh where are we on the um, committee to look at the public safety building? Because I, I thought we had not actually approved yeah you know, I, I, I saw your memo yeah uh, but I, I've got to go back and look at the recording I don't know I frankly I don't know what we said well it's in the minutes that we agreed to do it and I know but, but Barney's taking issue with that yeah oh, I, I could have sworn that we said um, we needed to have more discussion about what the exact charge was yeah. and also take a look at who the members of the committee would be and that it would come back to the select board to be, you know, authorized. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like that sounds good to me. Just why yeah, why but, we disagree to that and put that but on. But that's not what the minutes say. So we need right. we need. To, I mean, if we if we need to find out which of those has really happened. But on the other hand, I do remember that Luke and I kind of stepped up to be on it. But yeah. maybe it was on a some hypothetical committee. No, that was you. Were, you no, agreed to be. You agreed to be the select board's representative on that yeah. committee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I remember that, and but yeah. I was pretty sure we didn't vote on it. And so yeah. anyway, if it's if the if it's the case that we have not, um, I just would like yeah. to have that on the next agenda. Yeah, well, we we can yeah, and we can we'll we probably we shouldn't vote on those minutes tonight until we. So you're saying that. you think the minutes are not right? Correct. You can call differently than the minutes. Yeah. Uh, Oh well, yeah, definitely. Because it says the select board voted to approve. Um, I actually wrote a little. No, it doesn't. It said the select board agreed to establish. It didn't say yeah. vote. We didn't, we didn't vote, but we we. Well, we did, well, okay. Let me find my email because I was I was quoting it directly. Um, We can look at the recording because all the meetings yeah. are on. Right. Yeah, but I'm sure, I'm sure that if Jen said we voted, we voted. But if we, um, we don't agree we to do things even without voting sometimes. And right. so I, don't think well, I, thought, I thought you had to, um, in the past at least, we've always voted to establish a well, we, group no, and but, but, a charge. Two, two different things. If, if, if we did not vote, I'm if we voted, Jen would have certainly recorded the vote. Yeah, and we did not. And we did not. So the right. next question is, should we vote? Yeah, we should vote, but we didn't. So why don't you guys come back with the charter and you recommend people to yeah. serve them? Right. There, yeah, there, there is, a, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a specific charge here in the minutes. Yeah, okay. in the charge I don't believe we didn't, we didn't dis, well, anyway, yeah, I'd like to discuss that further. I'd also like to discuss the membership of the group. Right. Okay, well, that would be done when we, if and when whoever decides to take charge of this comes um, and brings the charge and a, and a, you know, proposed group of members to the well, board. You guys, for, are, you guys for, are volunteering, right? So, what? Well, no, I, <laughs> not I, me. David, you did. You and Kate. No, no. Oh, no, Kate and Luke. Luke. This one. This Kate is Kate and Luke. Luke. Yeah. yeah I, I, I can run with this. I'll run with this and we'll have something for the next meeting. All right. Okay. Excellent. Love that kind of resolution. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Liaison reports. 
Well, Alan, I think uh, we can talk about the town meeting date. Yes. Oh, yeah. I forgot. I yes. up there in the middle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Turns out CCHS and town meeting at, uh, on June 5th are the same day. Uh, they could have consulted us before they decided when to graduate those kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, school right. committees. Yeah. Yes, I know. <laughs> anyway, uh, we did get a uh, email from Wayne uh, giving us the number of dates in June where he is available. Okay. Including the 6th, which is a Sunday. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Well, when would we do this? Sunday morning? No, no it would be Sunday it was, afternoon after, would, after you church. Would, you would get the, the yeah. wrath of, exactly. That's the wrath of that's God would be on point. us. Yes. That was my point. Yeah. 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 So it would have to be in the afternoon. Yeah. It might be a little warmer, sunnier. Yeah. That'll be nice. Yeah, my my own bias was to take it put put it back in May, but go the other way. But go out, go along with whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, if you think that Sunday is good, that's fine. I'm fine with that. Have we ever done a town meeting on Sunday? No, we no. Won't. We, we usually have them on Monday and Tuesday night. Yeah. yeah, we didn't used to do them on Saturdays either. Right. <laughs> Uh, and we can't do the weekend before that, the 5th, because that's Memorial Day weekend Correct. and some people travel. So, I mean, you know, we're kind of in a box here. And I, I think and I think as you get further into June, people will be traveling too. Right. Yes. Yeah, because school gets out. Yep. Eight, school gets eight, out on the 18th. Eight. So let's go for the 6th. All right. Good. Sounds good. Uh. The other thing on that same agenda item is potential warrant articles. Do you want to discuss those this evening? I think, um, is it premature for those? Probably. So let's not okay. let's say we did. Okay. Now, for the fourth time, liaison report. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I got nothing. We, you know, the trailer, I, well, the uh, DPW trailer has been installed, but uh, looks nice. Uh, got a little work still left to, do, to hook it up, so hopefully it'll be good. Yeah, and I gave my FinCom report already. Uh, yeah. COA uh, has been getting additional grants, small grants by and large, but uh, useful grants. Uh, they've just got one for uh, addressing isolation and seniors and people who are, you know, maybe depressed and that sort of thing. They're, they're looking at how they want to go forward with that. Uh, they, they really see it as an a opportunity to go into an area where they really haven't uh, developed expertise before. And so they're looking at this. They, they, this, was a, this was a sudden thing they got. They got like two days to respond to money. It's not a lot of money. It's like three or four or five thousand dollars. But it's they're looking at it as, as an opportunity to, to perhaps expand what they do. Uh, other than that, they've got the, they've got some additional funding for uh, food insecurity. And we're working with that. So it's good. But yeah, things seem to be working pretty well. Uh, Joan was gone for a week. Uh, she just came back. And uh, so I'm sure things will be back to normal here pretty quickly. There, you know, all most of the uh, activities are going on as always ex as as expected, and I understand Brian's opened up the firehouse for haircuts again and that sort of thing. So that'll that's a good thing. Thank you, Brian. All right. Uh, any other liaisons? Okay. Minutes. Well, we got uh, two sets. Yeah. Let me see. I I gotta get the book, the date of the minutes though. Uh, I move that we approve the accept the minutes of Tuesday, February 9th, twenty twenty one, as presented. Okay, that's the one with the. Public question. charge in it. Yeah. Well, it just says that we, yeah. 
I just said that um, we said we would make a committee. Yep. Okay. I mean, it just, I don't think it's incorrect. Right. Didn't say we voted. Well, knowing Jen, it probably came right off the recording. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I don't want to roll, you know, roll, steamroll Barney if she doesn't want yeah. to vote. Well, for these. Um, I'm just looking at the. We can wait two weeks to approve it after we get clarity. Yeah, I, I would prefer that if you guys don't mind. Okay. And the other one is for the second meeting in February, right? 20. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, hang on. Oh, shoot. I just closed that stupid uh, thing up here. Um, yeah, uh, okay. I, I move we uh, approve the minutes of February 23rd, 2021, as presented. Yeah. I didn't see any changes or additions needed no. there. Okay. Okay. So I have a second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Arnold, aye. Pascal, aye. Lewis, aye. Mode, aye. Reed, aye. Thank you. All righty. Uh, warrants. I move. Well, I can't move. Go ahead. Well, we don't need to move anything. We don't have to move anything. We just right. We just thank Barney yet again for going yep. into town hall and signing the, the warrant. Yep. Warrant for Spending it. all that money. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Barney. No, you're yep. very welcome. And uh, did everybody sign the Woodward document? I did. I signed it on the way home from the thank dentist. You. So it's all done. <laughs> In blood? <laughs> Basically. All my, right. Thank my, you. Hand, my hand was the only thing that wasn't numb. So, you know, I was <laughs> able to still sign it. <laughs> all right. Any further discussions tonight? If not, I'll accept a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. We have motion in the second. All those in favor, roll call vote. Arnold I. Lewis I. Modell I. Reed I. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks Mary Lynn. Thanks, 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 Christina. Thank Thanks, Jeannie. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye -bye. Night night. <laughs>